Great, thank you so much. Great, thank you so much, Cameron. Um, so first of all, a warm welcome to all of you and thank you so much for joining us today uh, for what's gonna be a great discussion on inclusive innovation in manufacturing. Uh, I also wanna extend a thank you to RTI for hosting us and for so deftly managing um, our technology today. And thank you to Siegel Family Endowment for making this research and uh, webinar possible. So my name is Tanu Kumar and I'm a co-director uh, with the Urban Manufacturing Alliance. Uh, the Urban Manufacturing Alliance or UMA is a national nonprofit organization that's focused on building a more sustainable and inclusive manufacturing sector because we believe that manufacturing is a strategy for advancing economic mobility. Our work includes advancing place-based strategies, convening our over 800 members across over 200 cities to help them learn from one another and conducting research and policy work to support local manufacturing practitioners and ecosystems. So to that end, uh, we partnered with our colleagues at the University of North Carolina in 2022 to launch the Made with Equity project. And this project investigates how recent investments in technology and innovation in the manufacturing sector can benefit both companies and frontline workers, especially workers of color, women, and, other, and from other underserved groups. And at a time when there is uh, an unprecedented resurgence and investment in this sector, um, we felt that it's really critical to approach this opportunity intentionally um, in order to achieve those equitable outcomes. And so our core question uh, behind this project is, what are the strategies that workforce development and business support programs can take to achieve more equitable outcomes in their manufacturing sectors? And to answer this, uh, we've developed three case studies to understand how place-based in institutions are successfully partnering to pursue inclusion and innovation jointly through a mix of worker and form firm supports. And today, uh, we're just so excited to have this incredible opportunity to learn from these practitioners uh, directly and have a chance to ask them, um, ask them questions and hear more about their aspirations and challenges. So before we begin, I just want to orient you a little bit to the agenda and um, our moderators. Uh, so my colleague and collaborator, Dr. Sophie Kelmanson, who's a postdoctoral research fellow, at the University of North Carolina, we'll lead our panel discussion uh, with our presenters from Baton Rouge, Louisiana, Buffalo, New York, and Orlando, Florida, and Sophie will introduce them. Uh, we'll then have an audience Q&A, and I encourage you all to use the Q&A box at the um, bottom of your Zoom toolbar um, actively to um, put in your questions as they come up um, during the presentations, and we'll get to them at the end. Um, we also will have some concluding remarks from Sarah Lawrence, Director of Economic Development at the Research Triangle Institute, um, who's with us today. So yes, so enjoy, please add on your questions and um, we'll get started. I'm gonna turn it over to Sophie now. Thank you. Thank you, Tani, that was uh, great. Um, yeah, I echo Echo Tanu's excitement in uh, having all these great panelists here today. We've got um, Stephen Tucker, who's president and CEO of the Northland Workforce Training Center. Uh, Tiffany Barnes, who's the senior director of professional continuing education at Valencia College. And Dr. Gerard Melancon, my French is terrible, so I'm sorry if that pronunciation was a little off, um, who is CEO and founder of Durango Works. Um, and also former vice chancellor for workforce solutions at Baton Rouge Community College. Um, so tremendous amount of expertise with us. Um, and to kick us off, um, I'm gonna ask a, a question that sort of leverages um, insight from the case studies that we were fortunate enough to write about um, each of these organizations and some of their partners. Um, which you can find online on the UMA website. Um, but our, our case studies highlight work that um, each of these uh, people and their organizations do to enhance access to high quality career pathways in advanced manufacturing. And this is especially for people living in communities um, that are experiencing the negative impacts from historic disinvestment. So the first question I wanna uh, get us started with is, how do you and your partners think about building inclusion into your work? And what are your goals and aspirations for increasing access 
to advance manufacturing careers. Um, and uh, happy to let any of you jump in or I can uh, choose who wants to who wants to go first. Um, Tiffany, you're at the top of my screen. Do you want to get us? Sure, sure. Great question, uh, Sophie. So I think that uh, what I'd say is that I think it starts with the belief, first of all, um, that inclusive or providing equal access um, to opportunities and manufacturing is important for the community or the communities that you're serving, right? And so in Central Florida, um, where Valencia College is located, just very fortunate to be a part of an, an, an ecosystem, including our regional manufacturing association, our MEP, uh, Florida makes, local workforce boards, chambers, all of us, you know, really working alongside each other to employ inclusive practices, um, because that's important to the manufacturers, right? Um, they know the the talent shortage, right? Um, that that they're facing, and so I think if we want to talk about providing quality training uh, to individuals, um, we have to start with that inclusive of uh, mindset of that these. Uh, careers are for everyone. And then when we're talking about um, communities that have been historically um, uh, maybe underserved, um, making a concerted effort, right, to really go into those communities um, to connect those job seekers with employment opportunities they may not never thought about or naturally thought about, um, but to your point, are very um, rewarding careers and more importantly, um, economically sustaining uh, careers. That was lovely. Um, Gerard or Steven, do you wanna either react or share your own uh, experience? I'm waiting to hear, I wanna hear from my brother Steven. So I'll, I'll follow up after him. <laughs> okay, uh, thank you for that question. And uh, thank you UMA for putting together this webinar. Um, in Buffalo, New York, um, we have to be very intentional about developing an ecosystem that is inclusive, inclusive of not only minorities and people of color, but of women and other marginalized populations. Um, historically, you know, Buffalo has um, suffered from um, segregation, from some challenges. So when I talk about inclusive workforce development and economic development, one of the first things we started with, with um, this strategy is implementing a placemaking strategy. We wanted to invest in places where we can leverage the assets and have the biggest impact on people. So we put our Northern Workforce Training Center, which I'm the president of, right in the middle of a low-income neighborhood, a neighborhood that is 91% people of color, household incomes are $25,000 or less, um, and only 35% of the residents have access to a vehicle. So just by placing the center there, um, we felt like that would be a good start so that we can connect with these individuals who are seeking to um, prepare and hopefully uh, develop the neighborhood for, for further development. Um, in addition to the location, uh, we embed intense wraparound services with the delivery of all of our training programs. So uh, services that we know that marginalized populations need, such as child care, um, transportation, mental health counseling, substance abuse. We wanted to make sure that we embed all of those services as well as creating a, an inclusive culture um, in our facility. Um, and in addition to that, uh, we also wanted to make sure that we had a very aggressive awareness and recruitment campaign. Um, right now in Buffalo and Western New York, there are over 20,000 job openings uh, that go on field every day. Job openings for machinists, for welders, for mechatronics technicians. However, people just don't know that they exist. So um, we want to have a, a, an aggressive marketing and awareness campaign to those target populations and then support them as they progress through their careers to acquire the skills, obtain employment and advance, hopefully to achieving family sustainable wages and creating pathways out of generational poverty. So it's kind of like a holistic approach. Uh, we've gotten off to a great start so far, but we look forward to uh, scaling this work and. Um, assisting more people with accessing these great opportunities. Yeah, excited to dig into that more. Uh, Gerard, do you want to follow up? 
Yeah, I'll just follow up. And uh, it's so good to hear from Tiffany and from, and from Stephen. So, um, so and thank you, UMA, and, and for uh, for highlighting the project in North Baton Rouge, uh, the North Baton Rouge Industrial Training Initiative in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. You know that that process of inclusive inclusivity was built on the principle that power rests in relationships, and relationships are reciprocal. And, uh, and that goes between the intermediary, the community colleges, the uh, corporation that help chair the program and the subcontractors. And uh, over the years, it, it, it has evolved from the, you know, of course, when you get a bunch of corporate heads at the table and say, hey, we need to do something. Uh, and where this, this chemical plant was located, it was similar community uh, where Stephen's operating is, you know, on paper is is not is is kind of top of the bad list and bottom of the good list and a lot of myths around the people in the community. Um, but in reality, there are a lot of hardworking people in that community just don't understand how to, to get into those opportunities. So you get corporate heads saying, yeah, we'll do it. Sounds good. Call us when you need us. Um, and how we include the inclusivity was you say, oh no, no, you're gonna be with us through the whole journey of this process, and we need people that do the hiring, do the supervising, I need them to help us on the, the open houses of making the communities aware because they don't live in these communities. So they need to build a relationship with community. I need them when they, we start recruiting and interviewing the students for a selection. I need them to come by for open houses. I need, I need tours at your, at your company. Uh, we need to know, we need to know more, more about you and, you know, about our culture too, at the same time. So over the years, that's that's where the relationship has built. But all at the same time, accountability. We will meet quarterly, and they will hire. And the goal is be as part of the selection during the training, and while they're employed, and you provide feedback to the to the group, what's working with the program and what needs to be tweaked. And uh, so over the ten or so years, that's what that's how the the relationship has evolved, and uh, and you see the progress. And then um, very. It is it's and it's very now it's it's more like you know call will show up it's been before i left they, they, i just will go to the classroom at night and I, you know i'll see instructors there buying pizza hanging out uh you know they don't even call at all they just show up which is what you want and uh and so it's it's just it, it just gone from call when we need us when I'm just they're there and uh, and they're part they're just they're just part of the program they're part of the fabric so um, I find that relationship is very important but it's reciprocal there, there's just a two way street about that. I love that phrase power rests in in relationships um, that's that's a really nice way to conceptualize it. Um, I'm going to come back to that but first I want to pull in sort of another thread of this project which is around uh, technology and innovation so. Um, as we all probably know, conversations about the future of technology in our society, especially the impact of AI um, and automation in jobs are kind of at an all time high. And I'd love to hear from you all about how innovation and technology adoption sort of interfaces with your efforts to center equity in your work. Um, maybe we'll stick with the same order, um, if you don't mind going first, Stephanie. I don't mind at all. Ladies first, right? I'll kick it off each time. Um, so I really like this question, Sophie, um, because, you know, for me, I think you, the technology is really fueling the innovation, right? And so um, as, as a college, as we want to have innovative programs, innovative skills training programs so that we help individuals enter in the field of manufacturing, we have to consider, you know, new technology. So I think about, for example, like this fall, we're getting ready to launch a precision optics, photonics and fiber optics program. And uh, we're doing this in partnership or collaboration with um, the American Center for Optics Manufacturing. And so Obviously, we're employing, you know, some new technology in this program, but because we're training at the technician level, um, what I'm excited about is the diverse students that we serve. And so the manufacturers, they are excited because they know they have the talent shortage. And so when we talk about we're, we're going to increase, you know, the number of women, the number of veterans, the number of persons of color um, that are in the program, that, that is exciting to the manufacturers, right? So just that in an, in, in and of itself. Um, and then also uh, when we're talking about 
you know, the technology, I think it's important. I, I think that uh, Gerard might have mentioned this about when you're going, when we're having visits to employers or to manufacturers, sometimes we need to demystify what that means to be an optics technician, particularly for underserved communities. They, they don't know what it is. They don't know what it looks like, right? So when we have the manufacturers, they open the door so they can see what a soldering technician does, what an optics technician does, and, and that you can do this uh, this career, something that you may not have uh, seen yourself um, do it, maybe even have anyone in your neighborhood or your community that has this career, um, then they get to see the technology up close, right? They get excited about it. Um, they're excited to learn it. And so I think for Valencia, it's been a natural uh, partnership when we look at organizations like uh, the AmeriCom, the American Center for Optics Manufacturing, and how we're using that technology. And then at the level that we're training, the technician level again, um, because we're going to bring in those diverse um, student populations, I think it speaks to um, that question of equity. Thank you. And, and here in Buffalo, um, at Northland Central, which is the entrance to the facility that I oversee, uh, it's a 235,000 square foot facility, multi-tenanted building. Uh, we're the anchor institution, the Northland Workforce Training Center. Our mission is to train and prepare local residents for careers in advanced manufacturing and clean energy. But in addition to uh, the training center being located there, we also partner with our local manufacturing extension partnership, um, Insight Consulting. They're located there. They work with businesses to help them become more efficient and effective, um, help them with different process improvement strategies, as well as an organization called Buffalo Manufacturing Works. Buffalo Manufacturing Works, they work with uh, business and industry to help them consider automation, to help them consider um, Industry 4.0 technologies, additive manufacturing, the Internet of Things, and uh, what we find is that when when we in general when we talk about automation, right? Um, sometimes people see that as negative, as eliminating jobs. But what we found is that um, automation could also create jobs, and all not could create jobs. It does create jobs because as we are automating and using these new technologies, we need to upskill workers to be able to maintain and install the technology. And here's an example. Um, we are uh, prototyping um, an instrument called a cobot. A cobot is a collaborative robot that works next to a human. In most manufacturing facilities, you have the big robots, they are behind different sensors where they can't injure individuals. But with a cobot, it's so high tech where it can work right next to a human and sense and tell when it's too close and it can de-energize itself. So by prototyping this cobot, uh, we are allowing manufacturers to see how this works. If manufacturers are trying to adopt this technology, which can help their businesses um, increase their productivity, they're gonna need people to install these cobots, to maintain these cobots. Uh, one of the programs that we teach at Northland is mechatronics. Mechatronics is just a fancy name for people who understand electrical, electronics, mechanical, electrical, automation, pneumatics, hydraulics, cobots. So, um, we are testing out and prototyping these strategies right now in really automation. Um, yes, it may eliminate some jobs, but it's, in my opinion, it's probably going to create more jobs and eliminate. And those jobs will be highly technical jobs that pay higher wages. And of course, training marginalized populations for those jobs. That's where the, the, the component of equity and inclusion comes in. So yeah, we're excited about offering these types of technologies in, in Buffalo and West New York and excited about exposing our young people in our communities to these technologies so they can take advantage of them um, as these jobs come on board. Oh, no, I was going to talk about cobots later on in this, this section. You got you got to jump on me, Stephen. So awesome. Uh, but no, I, you know, I kind of want to look at it. I, I really think um, you know, there's some negative, but the, I really think there's more positive when uh, innovation, AI, and technology is coming to place in manufacturing. Uh, I like it from a, from a training perspective. I like to say it can really bridge some gaps. And, and the gap that I always came across um, with um, with training is I, I, I talk a lot about the Matthew, the Matthew effect and uh, the story, the parable about talent. And and in, in the training aspect, uh, and those who don't know, real quick, um, you know, there was a master, I hate to call it masters, I'll say a parent with three siblings. 
um, the parent went out of town and left their kids, um, as they call it talents, but it was actually money. And uh, left the first one, we'll say Tiffany, because she's an all-star. Uh, she got five. Uh, I would say St Stephen was next in line. He got two. And then, you know, me, the just the prodigal son, would only get one talent. So, and just how that happened, it was it was the perception of Tiffany has always done well, and I'm gonna give her more just because who she is. Um, Stephen was uh, had always perception and whatever he's he's done well, and he got two. And then my behaviors in the past predicted I would do one. And as a training provider, we have always done that. And in the end of the story, what happened, Tiffany doubled her talents with the five that she got. Stephen doubled his investment and got two. And then I, the individual who wasn't exposed and didn't have, it, it was a whole lot of factors that could have been, but I got one in the result of the story in that parable that always bugged me because I think that was the individual, why they didn't do anything for that, for the, the person had one. And they really cast that individual out of the community or out of the family. So I always view that technology can bridge that gap for the individual with the perception of one talent. And that what it can do, it can, all the things that our students come to the table for, they're, le they're reading below grade level, even though they graduated high school. Uh, they never were exposed to any manufacturing. There was no aunt or uncle on that pathway. So through AR and VR, they could get more repetition. Um, they, uh, they just weren't, they may not be in a situation to get mentored, um, even after work. Um, so there's a way, even after they go through our programs, there's a way they could continue to learn if they're on a crew that's not giving them the information and they could continue to stay in front of the game. But I always like to use AR, VR in our, in our, in our training aspect is to better prepare them than they would have gotten at any place else. And that's the beauty I see with, uh, with, with with technology in the workspace. And that's just a future work. And if you train our individuals to be very comfortable, expose them to where they do not have the exposure, um, give them a chance for repetition, troubleshooting. You can break stuff that's not gonna cost mess up the lab in a virtual setting. And they can really comprehend. If, if somebody grew up in an apartment their whole lives and you give them a gear, you know, you give them a standardized test to work at a factory and there's a bunch of gears and pulleys and, and gears moving around, and you've never worked on a lawnmower, you don't know if one motion is going this way, the opposite effect of the other motion. But if you expose them to that of how our motor is working or how gears work in just in a virtual setting, uh, they understand it. People, pe people pick up very quick if they're exposed to it. So that's why from a training aspect, I really see the opportunity. And for ongoing training after they leave you, get them comfortable with that technology because it just keeps them on the cutting edge of the work. Such great examples there. Um, thank you all so much. Um, the next question um, touches on something that you all have already started to mention, which is around the important role of partnership and building trust um, with your partners and the communities you serve. And so I'd like for each of you to talk about how you've partnered with your home communities around inclusion um, in manufacturing or maybe the community more generally. And uh, second, do you have advice for ensuring that community engagement and partnership building is successful? And maybe we'll flip it this time so Tiffany can have the last word. <laughs> Darn it, I was so excited to listen for Tiffany. Uh, so, you know, I, I really think, and I think Tiffany touched upon this and also Stephen, um, in many cases, uh, manufacturing is not new in some of our communities that we work in, uh, especially the ones that have been dis disinvested. Um, a lot of white fly, a lot of other things have moved in, but the factory or the operations are, are still there. Uh, I think when you kind of go into these communities, I always advise, even with the work with um, UMA, um, and even in my over my years of working directly as a practitioner, is you first go in, you, you, you got you got the you got the roll up you got the you got the flyers you got the glossies and look how much money you can make and you know look what you can buy and all that stuff and it's like when you go into like a church or into like a progressive community member you know they there's some trauma in the that community with that employer or that sector where uh, people that kind of look like you know look like us um, 
were the first fired or did the, the dirtiest of work with no career progression. And uh, I mean, the last hire and the first fired. And um, and that still sits home or worse. They were deaf. They were doing a lot of dangerous work with no you know, OSHA. The manufacturers have been around for a long, long time. So I always advise go in and just listen to the to get a clear understanding if you're an intermediary training provider or community based organization doing this work and you're trying to recruit people into these occupation, just go into a heart of listening and just see where you are. You don't have to bring them forward to the tape, to the at first meeting and stuff like that. And then just give it time, bring bring that information back um, and talk to your employer sectors and stuff like that. And to say, hey, this, these are some things that we need to overcome. And it just takes time. Uh, I think in many cases, uh, my work within the North Beverage Training Initiative, it became, it took about three years to see that, okay, this is real. Uh, what was in the past is not exactly present in the future with this company. I do see some changes. Nothing's perfect. We're always evolving and making things better. Um, but people are getting hired from our communities. People are coming to my churches with a great outlook. You know, they were working at Circle K. Now they're working at this manufacturer and they, they love it. And then those are the you know, and those are your stakeholders and, and they will promote it from there. But if I would have gone in with say, hey, you know, that that was true, but this is not it, it, it they'll just shut you off. But so you just got to give time of first of listening first and build that relationship and 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 do the work. It just takes times of listening and working and and make, making it work and following up with when when things do happen, make sure it gets resolved quickly, um, as quickly as possible. And Gerard, you you touched on a couple of key points in your um, response to that question. The first one was trauma. Um, the trauma is real, right? And, and here's what I mean by that. Um, the Northern Workforce Training Center, we're a brand new organization. We opened in 2018 and we're the signature workforce initiative under the Buffalo Billion. But before um, the city decided to revitalize the east side of Buffalo, um, community members felt like they were left behind, left out of the renaissance and the resurgence that was currently underway. Um, they saw multiple people developing businesses. They saw multiple people getting jobs. They saw multiple people getting contracts, but they didn't see people from the community. They didn't see people of color. They didn't see people um, who looked like them benefiting from these investments, despite these historic investments coming down the pipe. So even with construction on the way in this community, um, once I was hired and I kind of went on a listening tour, some of the feedback was, we see it, but we don't believe it. Or we see the building being developed. However, people like us are not gonna be welcome there. Or we see the facility going up, but we have a mistrust for um, government. We have a mistrust of organizations. Uh, we have a mistrust because of broken promises. So um, we had to work on um, developing a relationship with community members. We had to make a commitment and deliver on our promises. When you talk, I think Gerard, you also talked about broken promises. We had to actually do the things that we said that we were gonna do in terms of providing those wraparound services and placing people in the jobs and supporting them for three years and working with manufacturers so that they can change some of their internal cultures. Because in West New York, um, people of color represent less than 20% of all people working in advanced manufacturing. Um, women represent less than 5%. And um, with us developing a pool of qualified candidates and placing these individuals in these job opportunities, now they're walking into to places where they are the only person that looks like them in this facility, right? They may be the only person that practices their religion in this facility, and they may have some religious requirements, right? So working with those businesses as well to help them create those welcoming cultures. But um, just to follow up on what you said, the trauma is real. Um, having that listening tour, I think is critically important. Delivering on the promises that you present when you are um, making your rounds in the community, identifying community champions because they can be recruiters for you. These are all strategies that can assist you with um, making inroads with the community members who we are so desperately trying to serve. Yeah, and I'll just um, close it out with echoing what Gerard and, and, and Stephen so eloquently have talked about. 
Um, the, so the question is posed as building trust, right? I think if you stop right there, there's then the assumption that either there is distrust or uh, the absence of trust. And for a myriad of reasons, that is the case in the communities, right? Um, and so coming from that, um, I think from that vantage point, number one, that trust needs to be built, right? To Gerard's point, it doesn't matter that we're coming in saying, we've got this great program, you know, short term, we're going to get you these skills if there's no trust um, there. So um, what Stephen talking about, connecting with those community champions, what we have found successful is getting with the pastors, um, the community organizers, the local government officials that are already in those communities doing the work, right? And so by coming in and partnering with key individuals and then putting in the sweat equity, right? Going, we'll be there on the Saturday. We'll come to this community event. We will sponsor this, showing that we have the vested interest in the community. So now it's not just, you know, Valencia coming, you know, randomly and they're like, who, what, what is this program? But we're with this community organizer that they know that they've seen um, in the neighborhood. And so then I think it, it, it resonates um, a little bit more. And then also finding out what are the other needs, right? And so is there, if there's transportation is an issue, is, is our center on a major, you know, bus route? If not, can we work with city officials so we can make that happen? Or do we need to look at transportation vouchers or whatever those needs are, I think, um, but you have to be authentic, right? And so, um, because typically, you know, I would say these communities, they can sniff out the inauthenticity, right? It's like, uh, nope, get out of here with that. But when you show um, that you're vested, um, that you're willing to build the partnerships and willing to put in the work, willing to be there in the evenings, to, to, you know, to present at this event and only 12 people showed up. Sometimes we've gone to events and it's been more Valencia people than the people in the audience. And that's OK. You know, we just keep showing up to, to, to show that um, we are truly vested. And, um, you know, like I think Stephen talked about eradicating generational poverty. Wow, thank you so much. Um, all of those answers were really powerful. Um, following uh, on to that a little bit, um, I want to ask uh, how you bring employers into that conversation with you or how you connect them into uh, the work that you're doing there. Um, I was trying to figure out who nodded the most vigorously so you could start. I'll go ahead and start since uh, Tiffany and Gerard, they went first a couple of times. So I'll go ahead and kick it off. And um, right now we have a job seekers market, right? Um, businesses are desperately trying to, to find qualified candidates to fill their open positions. Um, fortunately for us, we partner with an industry association, the Buffalo Niagara Manufacturing Alliance. Um, this association consists of around 200 small, medium, and large size employers. Uh, they employ around 20,000 people in Western New York in advanced manufacturing. Right now, those companies, they have 3,000 job openings. So by us having technical training provided by two SUNY universities, SUNY is the State University of New York education system, um, they're already looking to partner with schools, high schools, technical centers, vocational centers, CTE programs, because they, they have to find qualified candidates to fill their positions. But one of the things that we try to do, we try to work with them to create those workplace cultures that will allow those participants to advance within their careers within those companies. Because it's one thing to recruit diverse talent. It's another thing for their talent to be retained and developed in advance. So we try to only work with those businesses who we have confidence in that they're gonna treat people right, that they're gonna have those cultures that we value as individuals, right? Um, so we're very aggressive with our outreach to our employers. Right now, it's pretty easy because of the current job market. However, we really only wanna work with those employers who are committed to offering those workplace cultures where all people will have an opportunity to thrive. 
Yeah, Tiffany or Jared, do you want to react or add to that? Yeah, I, I could go. I, you know, I think once again, like I mentioned before, it's, you know, when I came into our unit, probably about almost 11 years ago, you know, we, the, 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 we, we, we had the legacy of just being a training provider for one group and basically a union training provider. And that was all that the, the campus did. Um, uh, Louisiana is a right to work state. So they, what they have done, uh, they had created their own training programs and, and training systems um, outside of the, the community technical college system. So when I came in, um, uh, I still kept our relationship strong with the union. But I had to spend a lot of time, um, just like working with pastors and churches and community-based organizations, listening to them, you know, um, try to stay out, you know, the issues of right to work and all that. But they were they were starting for talent. And um, and I want to know how, as a um, training provider, I, we can provide the talent for them and the pathways. And uh, and for me, it was also assessing the cultures of these different organizations, kind of like Stephen, working with associations, but also individual large employers and uh and eventually you know we started and then it just kind of worked out that one they, they provided me instructors uh, adjunct instructors to train and you know we built our relationship and our reputation up say hey you know the, anybody's coming out of that program are ready to go to work for us and 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 then also ongoing training want them to come back for additional training and uh that that was basically the process um and just have like that feedback loop. Uh, things change, um, and we had constant engagement, constant meetings with them to see, hey, what's working, what we need to change, um, are we, you know, what do we need to make changes in the curriculum? Even those industry-based certifications, some there's a regional differences that there's different processes that's not covered in the textbook. So you know, we make sure we're on top of that, and our labs are, have the the hands-on activities to make that happen. So uh, you know, it's. Like with anything, it's just you know, working your relationships with with the employer partners too, and you do eventually weed out. And then it's funny to see how the um, the employers that you really stayed away from the beginning, um, leadership changes, um, you know, their their personnel changes, and they they became more, I'm not gonna say progressive, but just you know realistic, and they you know really more inclusive in in their hiring practices. Um, you saw how that. Their, their competitors were beating them out, really. So they had to make a change or they're, or they're going to be bought up by their competitors. So um, it was it was good to see that those changes happen over, over the years, so. Yeah, and I think that um, if I could just brag on our manufacturers um, that we have here in Central Florida, um, could be the landscape of where we are now with the, you know, the job market. But I will say that they just get it. You know, they realize that in order for their organizations to, you know, have sustainability, they have to diversify, you know, their um, their 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 workforce, um, their employees. And so maybe in the past conversations that would have been led at the college level, I'm finding manufacturers are, you know, asking, they want to know, you know, the number of women that were enrolled in my welding program, you know, if I'm doing a tour and they see a ponytail sticking out of a hood, they get excited. I'm like, calm down. It's just a guy with long hair. <laughs> but, um, you know, or the number of veterans, um, you know, that we serve there. I'm, I'm seeing where they're leading um, with those questions. And so um, I like that because then it, it allows uh, my team and I to look at to make sure that we're continuing uh, to do the recruitment and to continue to have the diverse student population um, that we know manufacturers are, um, are looking for. And then I think also, um, I think, you know, Stephen, when you talk about, I think manufacturers, they also realize that, so having one is is not going to do it, right? So if, if I am a female and I'm the only female in the welding shop, what what is that culture, right? So they also realize like, okay, well, maybe we need to look at just a more inclusive culture so that, you know, we can, when we're recruiting this other female welder, we can say, and we have, you know, Tiffany, who's also on the team and Sophie, who's on the team and they've been doing great, right? That, that goes a long way. So I just really, I think that here are manufacturers. They're definitely a part of that conversation. Definitely we're having it as well with our um, regional manufacturing association, which is manufacturing association, central Florida, just about um, the diverse talent 
um, that that is needed. But I would say that the manufacturers, they get it. Not only do they get it there, they're asking about it. They're looking at the institutions, wanting to know um, the diverse populations that we serve. And that makes me feel good because they feel like now they're seeing the value and just what an inclusive work environment looks like, right? Just that, you know, we all learn from each other and, and, and that when we are in rooms with folks that all don't look the same or think the same, that the opportunities for collaboration and growth that happen. Thank you so much. Um, so to, we have a, a few minutes left of the sort of uh, formal panel before we open it up um, to the attendees to ask you all some questions as well. Um, so to wrap up um, and to sort of build on this idea that uh, you all have mentioned around sort of letting people learn from your example, I'd love to know, given your leadership around inclusive innovation, if you were going to make recommendations to federal or state agencies that are tasked with restoring manufacturing, what would you hope that they would either learn from your example or uh, what would your recommendations be to make your work even easier? You know, I, I'll go ahead and go. I, I really think, um, you, it obviously, you know, when there's demand for employment, um, that means demand for hiring and, and, and placement of our students and, and economic growth in our communities. Uh, I really, I'm very happy to see with the, uh, the investments from the Inflation Reduction Act, Act and CHIPS Act and those type of federal investment, what that, that has done um, for our manufacturing sector. Uh, for example, even in the Baton Rouge, Louisiana, uh, we were doing a lot with staying to, to beat some of these carbon capture, you know, carbon, uh, carbon emission goals for 2030 and 2050. And through those investments, it provided new opportunities from carbon capture, new technology, um, new build out um, in these plants and these manufacturers. And that investment has, you know, provided more opportunities for people to go up those career pathways. So, um, and while meeting our, our global, you know, our, our making a smaller, you know, carbon footprint at the same time. So uh, that, you know, I, I would say do some more of that. Uh, I think strategic uses, you know, you do see tariffs here and there. Um, I think that for small to mid-sized manufacturers, um, you know, competing uh, on some unjust markets, um, you, know, I, you know, I see some of those tariffs have, have done good. Um, I, you don't want to be territorial, but at the same time, I've seen some self-sacrifice really do a collective good in the community because, hey, you know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a, a pipe steel company and I'm competing against um, international steel. And but with there's incentives to use my steel on infrastructure work, that means my, the plant can can ramp up to make more steel and more pipe um, for the infrastructure build out. So, you know, I think strategically using those have helped. Um, sustain jobs and and, um, and also I, I would like to see which I haven't really seen too much of it but any tax incentives for companies that are kind of employee owned um, situations um, ESOPs in, in general um, I think ESOPs are good especially when we talk about the use of technology and, and, and efficiency uh, if you're a worker and you own if you had ownership of that technology and efficiency you also can benefit from it uh, as it through our ESOP. And I see that's very useful. But you also, you know, you may vote in on implementing those things. So I don't know if there are any tax incentives or any benefits for, for companies expanding or tweaking, uh, getting more ownership rights to some um, workers in those situations. And I love that strategy around tax incentives uh, for ESOPs. Uh, oftentimes when we talk about equity, in general, we're talking about fairness, but I think we need to redirect the conversation to equity, meaning ownership. So how do we assist more people of color, more minorities um, to become owners in their businesses uh, through those ESOPs? Something else uh, that we're trying to do in, here in Western New York is trying to support uh, minority entrepreneurs into purchasing um, those legacy manufacturing businesses where the families, they don't want to continue the ownership, but maybe we can transition it to somebody else locally, keep those companies and keep those jobs here. So I wish the policymakers would find a way to support uh, those strategies as well. 
And from an education and training standpoint, um, just, and this is gonna just sound like redundant, but just less bureaucracy in general, it's very, very challenging and difficult to access uh, workforce development funding, right? We hear all the time on every press conference, every speech, every politician is talking about workforce development. I was listening to a podcast this morning and I think um, President Kennedy mentioned workforce development in the same speech where, where he mentioned that there will be a man on the moon, right? Uh, so all the way back to the 60s, we've been talking about workforce development and we've invested billions and billions and billions of dollars into that, but it's oftentimes very difficult for it to reach the people who are really trying to, to uplift. So less bureaucracy, maybe more um, funding support for short-term accelerated training to get people in and out and train quicker, maybe training for nationally recognized credentials. Of course, uh, we're, we're trying to ramp up apprenticeships, right? Uh, but micro-credentials, these are all uh, viable training options that sometimes the, the, the funding around those training options isn't as consistent as traditional community college training options. So more um, access to funding. That's fantastic. Thank you so much. All right, with that, um, and in acknowledgement of our, our time consideration, we're gonna move uh, directly into Q&A and Tanu is gonna help with that. Um, do you wanna share the, the first question um, from the attendees? Yeah, thank you, Sophie. Um, so our first question is, um, I'm looking for specifics on how you reach marginalized or underrepresented communities, specifically around advanced manufacturing, where they may think that they need a bachelor's degree. We are creating new community engagement activities to connect communities with life sciences manufacturing training and employment, but it's hard to do. And we are relatively new to this aspect of the work. Um, Tiffany, would you like to start with that one? And anyone can jump in. Yeah, sure. Um, I think that that's a great misconception, right? Just how many great careers are available um, in the manufacturing field that don't require a four-year degree or uh, even a two-year degree, just, you know, um, some skills training um, here at Valencia College. Um, we're training to that technician level, right? Um, so those many, all of our programs, you know, the students are able to get um, very, very good uh, entry-level positions into manufacturing without that degree. I, I, I would recommend, um, you know, leading with the, the career, right? The, the, the actual uh, occupation where um, the student and and even if it's you know looking at the 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 job description saying hey you know the they they're not requiring um this this degree and in some cases we have worked with the manufacturers that maybe because it's you know came out of the HR where it was just this two year degree requirement and then when we really peel back what is it that you really need the the, the technician to do. Um, we find that, okay, so you actually can take an industrial automation technician or mechatronics graduate, right, that has that foundation in mechanical, um, electrical, hydraulic pneumatics, and they don't necessarily need that to your degree to do this job. Maybe that sets them on a path for progression, but they don't need it. So um, I definitely think, you know, understanding the career opportunities, the employers that don't have that um, requirement and then partnering with the um, employers, you know, so that if there's events where you, the, the educational institution and the employer can attend together to say, hey, go to this training. And then when you get finished with the training, we want you, we're going to hire you right out of this training. You don't need to have that two year degree requirement, I think would be helpful. And I, I can just add, I think also, um, as a training provider, even an intermediary, it's just bring whatever you're training, have an open house, have it touch and feel, have them show, um, bring in workers from the employers um, and talk about their career pathway. There, you know, you know, there is something, and even if there is a testing requirement, uh, show as an intermediary, you will bridge that gap. If, if it's integrating IBEST, it's working whatever learning uh, difference they may have, 
you also will support them because many cases, just like I mentioned before, you know, just the whole being disadvantaged, if it came from a very, um, it came from a high school that had a weak science program, um, they think they're just not good at science, but they, they, you know, but you can show them that people can't really do math and science if they had very good instruction. Um, so you got to show how the, the, you, you will bridge that gap. You, they may feel um, intimidated. They may feel fearful and, and just not have the confidence. Uh, but make sure you're, you're talking to that and, and having supports in your training programs to lift those issues, lift that support up um, and give them hope. Um, but uh, I think that's just as important, whatever career. And then and then also be in the adventure, you'll say, hey, this is but if they're connected. There's going to be a lot ongoing lifelong learning no matter what occupation you're going to pick but they you, you address some of those fundamental things um, of their educational pathway with that career and, and i know we're short on time but just real quick i just want to add that um, we found workplace tours to be very effective we have a tesla plant we have a general motors plant we have ford we have pharmaceutical companies we have great companies making great products and people drive past them every day not understanding that People are working there making $100,000 a year. So we created a summer youth academy targeting ninth through 12th graders. And every Friday, we take them on a worksite visit. They go to the, the General Motors plant. At our General Motors plant, they're making Corvette engines. How cool is that, right? So allowing students, as well as their parents, to actually go to those plants, two of the plants, they can see that it's not the old, dirty, dark, dangerous manufacturing that is historically the perception of manufacturing, but taking them to those worksite plants, I, I, I believe has really opened the eyes to not only students, but some parents about some of these careers. Great. Thank you so much for those answers. Um, I'm going to move to our next question, which I think I'll direct um, to Stephen. Uh, first, and then allow anyone else to jump in, of course. Um, so how do you build a skills training center in a place which is accessible to the community? Do you have to advocate and lobby a lot? What was the advocacy journey like? Um, experience from Portland, Oregon is that it's incredibly difficult to come in consensus to find land and investment for community-centered and public transportation, or at a, for a community center that is accessible to public transportation. So in Buffalo, I was kind of lucky because uh, the decision had already been made to invest in um, this low-income community. But in general, um, the manufacturers, they were the ones that advocated for a training center to be built because they could not fill their open positions. And when business and industry can't fill positions, it's not a good thing for the local economy. That's what triggered the state to say, okay, we're going to make an investment in a training center. And then the local politicians, uh, the governor, not the governor, Mayor Brown, he advocated to revitalize this community. But I think it takes a, a collective approach, a community approach. The community members got to say that they want it. Um, the businesses got to say that they need it. The elected officials need to develop a plan to show how they can sustain it. And once you have all those three elements, I think you will have the foundation to get different support, not only from government, but from business as well as philanthropy. Gerard or Tiffany, do you want to um, weigh in on that? I apologize, Tay, my screen went squirrely. Um, no, I, I'll say I think Stephen hit, hit it right on, on that. He hit the the um, the triangle for that. You know, you do need an employer, community, and government uh, buy-in. Um, to, to make a facility work. Uh, I went to some similar, it wasn't a new facility. We, we, we uh, uh, the campus that we operated in North Baton Rouge Industrial Training Initiative was a very old facility. It was back from the 1960s. I think the last renovation was probably in the 19, 1990s or maybe 1985. So it was like one of those buildings, um, some people, power to be, thought we should just bulldoze it and build it, you know, build a new center someplace else. Um, but it was something that we want, you know, we kind of advocated for. Luckily, the the program was kind of very established in that community, which helped with the, with our uh, large industrial partners and the subcontractors. And they wanted that training program in that, uh, a, a nice training facility in there. And that helped leverage, you know, not, I think Steven's 
facility is like $100 million. We got $20 million, but um, it probably, uh, the majority went to the roof, the cover the roof leaks. But uh, yeah, about 90 yeah. million bonds went to the roof. <laughs> yeah. well, so yeah. Don't let them do it. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, exactly. But you know, that, that did help um, uh, a lot uh, just keep that facility there and for future investments too. Great, thank you. I'm gonna to try to squeeze in one more question. We can take like one or two, two minutes to answer this last one. Um, so this is for any of you, but do you see any specific examples of companies participating in or supporting, or participating in supporting and funding wraparound services? Um, and if so, can you provide those um, examples? So I'm going to jump in here because I saw that question come in the Q&A and I was like, I can't wait to share an example. Um, it's actually not a company, but it is with one of our largest uh, nonprofit organizations. So Valencia, we've partnered with our local United Way chapter, the Heart of Florida uh, United Way, and they are providing stipends living stipends for our students because we operate our, our classes in an accelerated format. That could mean students stop working or less hours so that they can go to school, right? But as we know, life doesn't stop, bills don't stop. And so through our partnership with the United Way, they are helping students to close that gap. If you've had fewer hours um, so that your paycheck is smaller, now you're able to receive a stipend to support you in some of the other areas where you need support while you're investing in yourself and going back to school. And so when I talked about earlier, finding those champions, right, we know Heart uh, United Way already supporting our Atlas families, you know, asset limited income constrained employee, basically the working, the working poor. And so they're just as committed as Valencia is of providing these skills training for individuals um, so that they can, again, have uh, economic sustainability. So thank you for that question. Just give me a chance to brag on that partnership. So it doesn't always have to be a company. It can be a nonprofit organizations, but there, find that alignment in your community where you can um, align resources and when you're already trying to serve the same individuals. Thank you. Gerard, Stephen, any last? Uh... Well, I, I saw Stephen uh, had his uh, mic off. But yeah, just from our standpoint, through the North Baton Rouge Industrial Training Initiative, what we did, uh, we used we leveraged our foundation. So annually, uh, companies would give and we would put unrestricted dollars in the foundation, really to try to help the, the participants get through the training program. So, you know, there are situations where, a, you know, apartment burned down, we needed down payment assistance for a new apartment you know we were able to go to the foundation with that or somebody's alternator went out we were able to do that uh, you know through that through that pot of money um we also you know or, or there was you know deaths you know we, we were able to you know kind of to follow up on, on some uh, family stuff with that so those unrestricted dollars through the foundation from the consortium of employers helped with that uh one thing I we also our unit kind of spoiled our employers in many cases. So we would try to leverage some federal dollars like SNAP ENT or uh, WIOA. Uh, WIOA has a lot of restrictions. Um, many cases, my students were already working, so they weren't they were over 100 percent of federal poverty, so they wouldn't qualify for WIOA. But those individuals who weren't working, we could leverage those those WIOA dollars for supportive services. That would be a policy recommendation I would like to change though, is 100% of federal poverty with WIOA dollars. It needs to be 250 or 300. If you're trying to get the Alice population, the working poor moving forward, the threshold is way too low to use that pot of money. So back to the policy thing. But anyway, I'll stop there and get some of Stephen's thoughts. No, everything you guys just said, uh, we, we have a vehicle. It's an industry sponsorship um, program where businesses, partners can provide a tax deductible donation to our organization. We are a 501c3. They are benefiting from um, the training and the qualified candidates. So we give them a way to donate to us. And every year we probably raise about $150,000 a year from industry sponsorships. Uh, so that's that's one vehicle that we created for employers to to be able to support the wraparound services that we deliver. 
That's great. Thank you so much. We could continue this all afternoon. I know these are phenomenal answers. I appreciate you all so much. I'm um, I'm just going to turn it over to Sarah Lawrence, who's the director of um, economic development RTI to close us out for today. Yes, thank you. I'm going to close it out with a big virtual. Can we? How do we do a round of applause for? Um, I mean, can we just clap? Or I guess yes. I mean, this was um, tremendous. Thank you so much, Tiffany, Gerard, and Stephen in particular. Um, I just I know where. Yay! I love seeing these claps and hearts going over the screen. Um, you know, as just very high level as we work in economic development across our country, I truly believe our practice and field is changing to. Um, better center equity in program design and delivery at best, um, at worst, it being more inclusive and aware of the need to be more inclusive in all the work that the economic development world is is performing and i think it's examples like these that give it that concrete way to understand how regions communities around our country can can do just that so i also just wanted to give a shout out and thank you to uma to new unc the Siegel foundation for helping to elevate um, these examples and i know that unc i believe is also doing some additional case studies so we continue to learn from just great practice that's happening all around us but thank you so much um tiffany gerard and stephen and for all of you for attending much much appreciated thank you for having us really appreciate the opportunity and it was great being on the panel with uh, such esteemed colleagues tiffany and gerard look forward to working with you in the future yeah, well, thank you. Yeah, I go. Thank you, everyone. Thank you all. Yes, thank you. Thank you. And uh, just a note that you can uh, read the full case studies uh, on the uh, UMA website that were um, authored by uh, Sophie and Dr. Nicola Lowe and I um, and Katie Stanton at UMA. Um, so it's urbanmfg.org for the full case studies. Thank you so much for joining. <laughs>